All right. Does that sound okay? Can you, just, you guys hear me okay? All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight and for uh, choosing to spend part of your evening with us. Uh, my name is Paul Koshal. I'm the director of public works. Uh, I'll kick us off, but I'll hand off the mic pretty quickly here. Um, we're joined tonight by uh, several of our public works staff, as well as our consultant team led by Civic Mike and NBS. Um, and uh, we do have a couple of presentations that uh, we'll walk you through, but we do intend to leave quite a bit of time at the end after those presentations for questions. We assume you guys will have questions and, and hope you'll share those with us. Uh, we're here to talk about landscape and lightning maintenance um, for LLMD 11. This is for Paradise Valley. Um, hopefully you're in the right place. Uh, we do have uh, two meetings tonight. After this meeting, we have another one in uh, Rancho Solano. We have two meetings tomorrow. This will be the first of you know several uh, opportunities for, for you folks and your neighbors to engage and ask questions. Um, we are going to have a follow-up virtual open house in a couple of weeks. We're also going to have pop-up meetings where you can come and ask questions and stop by for an hour um, if that's uh, better for you or your neighbors. Um, so just wanted to mention that and put a plug in for that. So we'll, um, we're also going to, um, uh, the team is also going to be uh, releasing information um, almost basically on a weekly basis, um, kind of information nuggets that'll get posted out um, through various channels. So look out for those informations as well. Um, it is a lot of information if you guys have taken a look at the engineer's report. So sometimes it's easier for people to get, you know, bite-sized pieces um, to be able to um, absorb that information. So we're doing it all different ways. I just wanted to put that plug in to look out for that. Um, and I think with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Michelle, who's going to walk us through meeting logistics and uh, take it from there. Thank you, Paul. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to welcome everybody and say uh, I know that there are a lot of people here who have been through this experience with us for about a year and a half. And I just want to take a moment to thank those people for um, the hundreds of phone calls and the emails and the questions. It's all so important. And I just want to thank you for being so involved in your community. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to go through the agenda really quick. So um, Paul just gave his welcome. This is the introduction. Chris will go through a very brief history of the district. Um, then Sarah will take on the engineer's report, which I know you all are waiting for. And then what everybody's really waiting for is the question and answer portion, where we're going to really try to uh, hold a lot of space for that. And then we will conclude. So I um, just want to say that I, I know a lot of people here, and I know we are all very respectful, and I hope that we can um, respect each other and respect everybody has some different opinions in here, and I just want us all to be mindful of the way we speak and um, the amount of questions we ask. Uh, so that's, that's it. I'm going to keep it really short. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'm going to hand it over to Chris, and she's going to go over the history of the district. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Chris Lewis um, with uh, Department of Public Works. I just wanted to go over a brief history, and I do mean brief, just so we can leave that time open at the end for questions. So the Paradise Valley uh, LLMD was established in 1989 in anticipation of all the new development that was happening in this area. Uh, shortly thereafter, in 1995, council approved maximum assessment rates of $190 per parcel per year. And the district currently maintains um, lighting and landscaping on Manuel Campos Parkway, Paradise Valley Drive. There's a couple trails and along the perimeter of uh, the district. The district does not, however, maintain the golf course. Um, all of the golf courses maintained by enterprise funds generated directly from the golf course and other general fund subsidies. Next, please. The district currently receives um, about $275,000 in revenue. I know there's a lot on this table. I'm not going to go over it line by line, but um, I just wanted to point out the assessment revenue and general fund revenue of about $275,000 per year. Um, I've outlined fiscal years 18, 19 through 2021 just to give you a baseline. Um, the last couple years, they've been anomalous. We've had a loan um, to, to supplement our, our shortfall. We've had a reduced services, so they didn't really give an accurate picture of what regular operations look like in this district. But I wanted to show this table because I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that right here you can see over the last three years especially, we haven't had any room for any contingency expenses, um, nor have we been able to build any reserves um, because the budget has been um, 
upside down pretty much. And at the bottom of the table, you can see that right here, a net surplus and, and deficit that we've been dipping into our fund balance reserves over the last three years. And not for any additional projects or anything like that. This has just been to support regular operations, which of course you probably already can um, you know, see that's not a sustainable funding source for regular operations. Um, so in 2021, there was some staff turnover in our department, and um, new staff began to uh, look at this and start projecting out and uncovered this funding shortfall. And we began the process to increase funding in this district to take care of this issue. Next slide, please. The proposal to generate additional funding in this area um, comes in the form of forming a new LLMD for this area. Um, essentially an overlay district with the same boundaries, um, with small minor tweaks here um, in, in very few locations, and providing the same services as the existing district provides uh, right now. So the proposed district comes, um, here's the budget for the proposed district, and of course it does include increased assessments um, to all property owners. Um, this budget is outlined in the engineer's reports. If you guys have a copy of that, you can also find that on the Civic Mike website. Um, but in addition to the increased assessments for all the property owners, I also wanted to point out that this is also um, increasing the general fund contribution by $150,000. So um, the gen new general fund contribution is proposed at $170,000. In addition to that $170,000 um, contribution, we also have $70,000 in city assessments. So for city-owned parcels, um, there's an additional $70,000 for uh, those assessments, including the golf course. So the golf course is, is uh, we're proposing that the golf course will now be paying assessments. This budget also includes adequate funding for quality landscaping as opposed to the low bid providers we've had in the past. Funding for upcoming street light repairs and maintenance and even replacements as um, these, uh, the infrastructure here is, you know, 30, I'm, I'm not really sure how old it is, but I'm sure it's 30 years old at least. And it also gives us room for contingency and reserves right here. You can see that line item there, about $60,000 each year. And I know that's a small amount, but um, we, we do feel that if we have the adequate funding to take care of the regular maintenance, what we can do is build those reserves over time to make sure we have uh, funding for capital replacements and um, any major repairs and expenses. Now, this budget represents the maximum um, budget for the district. Um, it could be this or it could be lower. In all honesty, it will probably be lower because that contingency line item, you know, once we get to a comfortable level of reserves, we'll, we'll stop assessing for that. So um, this is just the max budget so that we can come up with the max rates, um, use this to come up with the uh, max rates, which is outlined in the engineer's report. All right, and I think that's it for me. I'll go ahead and pass it on to Sarah. Who, um, yes, sure. Yes. Contribution. Yes. It, yeah. Um, and yeah, <laughs> it, it has to do with the new methodology. Um, and I'll go ahead and pass this on to Sarah so that she can explain that portion. Um, probably not in the budget, but the idea is once we build a comfortable reserve um, and we will have that funding available to us to take care of any contingency expenditures. I mean, I'm talking about it's probably going to be five to ten years out when we start reducing that or stop assessing for it. It will always be in the budget, but where we pull that from, whether it's from a... If I could give my presentation, I think I'm going to answer a lot of your questions. <laughs> so we, we'll have a lot of time for questions at the end. My presentation, I promise, is going to be short. Um, they told me I had 10 minutes, and I'm going to try really, really hard to keep it to time. So um, all right. My name is Sarah Mares, just quick introduction. I'm the Director of District Formation Services at NBS. I have been doing this for more than 20 years. I have a lot of experience in assessment districts. Um, and this is what our firm does day in and day out. This is what we do, is work on these types of revenue measures for public agencies. All right, next slide. Okay, quick agenda for my presentation. I will talk about methodology. 
Again, this is really focused down to the engineer's report. I'm going to talk about methodology, special and general benefit. We'll talk about the improvements. I know Chris just gave you some of that information, so we'll touch on that again with a map. Um, we'll talk about the budget and the assessments, how they were calculated, what the cost estimate is, and we'll talk about the formation process. How is it that we go about forming this new assessment district? Next slide. Okay, methodology. We are governed right now. This is an assessment. That is a very special word. It is not interchangeable with tax or fee under state law. So California has uh, Article 13D is now part of our Constitution that was voted in under Proposition 218 in 1996. So we now have to follow, of course that was after your original district was formed, right? We now have to follow constitutional and other legal provisions relative to assessment districts. So we are now operating under a completely different structure than this original assessment district was formed under. So I think that's really important to understand because Proposition 218 gave us very specific procedural requirements for assessments, and it also gave us very specific substantive requirements for assessment districts. It did not, however, give us a prescription for how to form an assessment district, how to calculate special benefits, what special benefits are for specific improvements. There's not a table somewhere that says, do it this way. So that's where the assessment engineer, NBS, comes in in terms of analyzing all of the data that we have available to us to come up with the methodology that's used for the assessment district. The process to do that is first to identify the improvements to be maintained. Then we determine the maintenance cost estimate. From there, we identify the parcels that benefit from those improvements. We separate the general and special benefit. We'll talk a little bit more about what those two things are. We'll allocate the proportional special benefit to each individual parcel in the district, and then we'll calculate the assessments to be levied. Next slide. So these okay. So you have 368 streetlights, 1,875 street trees, and about 910,964 square feet of landscaping in your district that is being maintained. Next slide. In terms of the methodology, first we have to determine what the special benefits are. So for street lighting, we've identified that the special benefits are improved safety and improved accessibility. Uh, can you go one down, please, Michelle? Thank you. For street tree and landscaping, we've determined that the benefits are improved aesthetics and increased livability. So those are benefits that are conferred to property within the assessment district by these improvements. In order to allocate that special benefit proportionately, we're looking at the various types of property in the district, and we're looking at things like land use, building size, lot size, and uh, uh, average daily trip information to determine how we can relate parcels to each other, because it's benefit conferred is not going to be equal on a per parcel basis if you have, say, a large commercial building or a large golf course as compared to a single family residential. So we need to figure out a way to relate all of those parcels to each other. And we use those factors to come up with a point system. Next slide. One more. General benefit is any benefit that accrues to parcels that are outside the district or to the community as a whole. And the primary method to determine general benefit in this type of district is looking at pass-through vehicular traffic. So we are, and I know this is a little hard to see all of this detail, these are actually tables from the engineer's report. So if you want to dive into some of those numbers, you can see that on the engineer's report. Um, we're looking for, at the streetlights, we're looking at the number of street lights, we're looking at the location of those lights, and we're determining what the pass-through traffic is in various locations throughout the district based on where those improvements are. Same thing for landscaping. We're looking at where the landscaping is located. We're looking at the um, amount of landscaping. 
on those areas and then we're looking individually at some of those streets to determine what the pass through traffic is. And I just wanted to point out here because I know this is a topic that has come up, on Interstate 80 you see that we have allocated for that particular portion of landscaping 100% pass through traffic. We're recognizing that the landscaping that is in this assessment district along the freeway has 100% pass through traffic to this district. Running those calculations, we come up with an overall general benefit percentage of 32.32%. That means that that percentage of the overall cost of maintenance is not assessed to properties in the district. That's the general benefit contribution that Chris just spoke about. Next slide. This is the budget. I won't go into a lot of detail here because this is something Chris just went over a little bit, um, but you can see the budget there, the various categories. Uh, this budget was developed in uh, looking at the improvements that you have and with an understanding that the feedback from the community has been, we want it to look really nice like it did before. And this is the budget that we've developed to be able to do that. Next slide. So we take the total cost of those improvements. We subtract out that general benefit portion. There's a little bit of rounding in there when you start applying percentages to numbers and so forth. And we are now coming down to the total cost of the improvements that's going to be assessed, $564,541. Or $564, Next slide. <laughs> so what does that mean for you? We calculated on the previous slide a rate per benefit point, and I told you we're using a point system to calculate the special benefits to relate each parcel uh, by land use and size and so forth to each other. So single family residential under the proposed assessment, the average amount per parcel is $392. The lowest per parcel amount for single family residential is $106 and the highest is $1,957, again based on those factors such as building square footage and lot square footage and uh, vehicular trips. Again pointing out that public property pays into the assessment that is a portion of what uh, is in the Constitution as a result of Proposition 218, so publicly owned property does pay into the assessment. And there's um, also a couple of other types of property. The, the clubhouse um, also pays into the assessment. There's an assisted living uh, facility and then undeveloped property pays as well. So again, we're just kind of giving you some samples here. The individual dollar amounts or proposed assessments for, for each parcel are available on civicmike.com. You can go take a look at your parcel and see what that proposed assessment amount is. Next slide. So in terms of process, there is a ballot proceeding that is also part of Proposition 218. We have to send you a ballot. This is not something that anyone is um, forcing on you. You all have a say in this process, and the way that we do that is through this assessment ballot proceeding. This assessment ballot proceeding is not a vote of registered voters. It is a ballot that is cast by property owners. If you do not own property within the district, you do not have an opportunity to cast a ballot. Again, part of the Constitution, part of the uh, Prop 218 provisions. The ballot is weighted by the assessment amount. So if I have a ballot and my property is maybe smaller, smaller residential property and my assessment is $100 and Chris owns property, maybe hers is a little bit larger and her assessment amount is $200, her ballot will be worth twice as much as mine. Okay, so it's weighted on that financial obligation. The options when you receive your ballot that you could, there'll be two check boxes. You can check that you're in favor or you can check that you're in opposition. The way this works of the ballots returned if the ballots returned, the total value of the assessment amount, if the value in opposition is greater than the value in favor, then there is what's called a majority protest and the district is abandoned, this new district, and your existing assessment district stays in place. If the opposite is true, 
if you have more assessment amount in favor, then you have an opportunity to form the new district. Next slide. One, one more. In terms of the schedule, we're looking at April 18th for the resolution initiating proceedings. That would be the council meeting where council considers a variety of resolutions, including preliminary approval of the engineer's report. Ballots would then be mailed out. June 6th would be the public hearing. That is the last opportunity for you to return your assessment ballot. Ballots have to be submitted prior to the close of the public hearing on June 6th. The ballots will be tabulated in public view on June 7th, and then there would be a council meeting that day also to announce the results of the ballot proceeding. So that is the end of my presentation, and I think now we'll start opening it up to questions. Danielle has a microphone, so she's gonna come around just making sure we can pick up all of the audio. Right, so since this is being recorded, um, we want to make sure that it's picked up on the camera. So let's, if everyone can limit their questions to one question at a time so we can go around the room and get questions from the majority of the attendees. If you have another question, we'll come back to you after, you know, we've gone to a couple people. The golf course is owned by the city of Fairfield. Will they be voting? They will receive an assessment ballot and, and have an opportunity to cast that ballot. We have the Director of Public Works present. Can we have an indication of the city's feel? The other one is Paradise Valley Estates. At their $57,000 assessment has a very large weighted vote. Both of these two will be able to outweigh all the citizens, I believe, together. Very close. So what is the city's feel? Um, so. I'll take the question, but I'll look to our city manager here for confirmation. I think David will be, a city manager will be casting the ballot. Is that correct? And do you want to confirm whether or not, or do you want to withhold that information? We have uh, Rick over here who has a question as oh, well. Sorry. <laughs> now, now, if I understood you correctly, the Interstate 80 portion, or visible from Interstate 80 portion of the district, will, <clears throat> will be 100% general benefit. Yeah, that's correct. So we were able to measure the amount of landscaping that is along the freeway, mm -hmm. and that is a portion of that um, about $170,000 general benefit that's amount, that the, the cost of the landscaping relative to that um, So it's that the same as if it wasn't even included in the district, because 100%, correct. okay. My friend with the nice sweatshirt. I was going to, I'm trying to think how I want to phrase this. Um, the cost wasn't based on a CPI, correct? Correct. The cost is based okay. on the actual cost of providing the work to maintain the landscaping and the lighting. And that's because we're forming a new district? Correct. Is there an automatic inflator built into this? Because uh, I know we couldn't do it before because it, 218 puts a kibosh on that. But yes. Are they going to put an inflator in there, a 2%, 1%, whatever the CPI is, something like that? Yes. Okay, yes. so we won't there run is... into this problem. I'll be gone when it happens, I guess, but... Uh... <laughs> exactly right. The, okay. the intent behind including an inflator is to not have to come back and do this okay. again. You know, you, you never know 50 years out right. what may happen, but um, right. yeah, that, that's the intention. Okay. We're not going to be back here five years from now saying, oh gosh, we don't have enough money. Again, right. if, if we're able to um, include that okay. inflator, that's the intent. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anyone else before we go back to Rick? Uh -huh. All right. The uh, areas that we're going to be getting, or $170,000 is going to be contributed to pay for general benefit areas that are within our district. My question is, why don't we spin those areas off completely? They're perimeter areas. Manuel Campos was in our district from uh, a marker near Mystic Drive all the way through to North Texas. 
The new map indicates from Dover forward, it is not included any longer. So it has, it has been eventually re, factually removed from our district. And the new map also indicates that there is a section within the freeway strip that it dodges around. So in other words, it has removed approximately 25% of that area. My question is, why don't we remove all the general benefit areas, especially since they are perimeter, and as a new district, a new district would seem to be able to have new boundaries. So we should be able to draw that and just have it locked off so it's not lumped in to our numbers. Also, so we don't say one of the exact same problem we have today that should right. have been fixed in 2007, 10, when the menu campus opened. Yeah. Right. So not all of the general benefit areas are on the perimeter. There are a couple of them that are, are there on the perimeter. Um, the map that's in the engineer's report that shows the improvements where that has kind of that, you know, jagged line, this is, um, there are some situations when you're utilizing GIS and parcel lines and spatial data and so forth that lines sometimes get a little wonky to reality um, in terms of where those spatial lines are. So that landscaping along I-80 is, is in the district. Um, it, so, where it looks like there's a minor jog, there that is in the district. Um, the but again, the, the general benefit accounts for some some areas that are closer to the perimeter, but that is not all of it. There's not a way to just carve out the general benefit portion of the landscaping completely. The oversight committee will have input. If, if the landscaping is completely removed, then that would not be under the purview of an oversight committee. There is very little of the improvement that is perimeter. Just just to be clear, it really is just that area that is um, that it, uh, that is a hundred percent general benefit. It really is just that area along the freeway. That is the only piece of, of landscaping that is under question that would be a hundred percent general benefit. All of the other landscaping has some special benefit to the district. So that is the only area under consideration. And it is, again, a hundred. that portion is allocated as 100% general benefit. So it's really six one half dozen the other. It's six one half dozen the other. I mean, it, it, either way, it's the same result. So, I mean, we could do it that way, we could do it this way, and it, again, it just is, um, it's the same result either way. Going back to the, the map, the, <clears throat> the, what changes have been made from the original district boundaries and parcels included in the district? Is there a greater rate base now because you've added some parcels that weren't paying before? Uh, have you deleted some? You know, I, I'd be interested in, in knowing what change has been made to the original 1989 map. Th 
there, there may have been, from the original 1989, there may have been some annexations, you know, from that very original district, but, but this is, is very generally, this is very close to the, the, the existing district. So there, the changes have been very minor to clean up very small pieces of um, portions of landscaping. Primarily, uh, there was a little piece down here over off of Manual Campus that was removed because it was, um, it was more, it's actually over here kind of outside the district. So, but in terms of the number of parcels that are included, um, there are some areas, it's a little harder to tell, some areas uh, kind of in this area that were added. So there, there are a few more parcels. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. It's not very many, but it's a few. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, we're going to go here and then we'll come back to you. I just wondered how the traffic counts were done. In order to determine the traffic information, and this is all detailed in the engineer's report, I was actually just going to get the um, page number for you so that you could refer to the... So, um, so we're not conducting traffic studies. That's not part of what, what we're doing. We are looking at um, ITE, or Institute of Traffic Engineers, um, data for um, average daily trips, and we're comparing that to the... Um, trips that would be um, on roadways based on the functional classification of the streets. So we're looking at Caltrans data and so forth um, to determine the functional classification of the street and then what that, so it's a theoretical to theoretical comparison um, and the reason we're doing that is because um, traffic data is very difficult. Um, you know, traffic studies are not done you know, really all that frequently a lot of times, and um, they can vary quite a bit. So that theoretical to theoretical um, has, we've we found to be the best and most accurate. And we always check that. We actually started this analysis looking at some of the real data and felt like it was not an accurate representation. So that was a conversation we had with city staff to say, gosh, this doesn't, it doesn't quite smell right. It's not, you know, it doesn't feel like this is the right number. Let's look at the theoretical and see if that feels, you know, better based on our experience, based on what we're seeing on the ground. You know, we have people in this community driving around and they said, you know, yes, this is feeling much better in terms of the um, numbers and how things were shaking out. The which number? Your numbers of traffic. You're telling me you didn't measure the traffic that you used. Correct. So what model did you use? Maximum? Minimum? How much traffic can actually sustain and go or did you come up with some barriers? No, we and again this is all this is all detailed in the engineer's report, but we looked at each the functional classification of each of the roadways that we were looking at, right? Well, what the city's traffic information, oh, Ryan wants to answer this question. Hold on. <laughs> so to answer that question, we have, we, uh, the city of Fairfield has a travel demand forecasting model. And based on that, we have a level of service. So level of service based from A all the way to F. So F is being failing and A is like free flowing traffic. So what this analysis looked at was C. So on an average basis, what would the, what would Manuel Campos handle? Okay, ask the question and I'll repeat it. I, I think as a sales point as, as, and just for information, uh, there was no CPI built in to the original assessment district. Um, it was $190 per parcel at that time. Is the new CPI going to be fixed or is it going to be a variable based on the actual CPI? Do you know what that's going to be in the ballot? It's going to be in there for the... CPI was 3%. 
CP, uh, so the question is, what is the CP, you know, what is the inflator? Is it going to be a flat 3%, a CPI? Are there, if it's CPI, are there bounds on CPI? We all know CPI is higher right now than it has been in the past. So just looking at all of that, it's going to, you know, what is proposed in this district is that it'll be CPI or 3%. Whichever is lower or higher. Will not exceed 3%. So interestingly, just to repeat the question, um, what of the existing rate for the existing district, if that number had been inflated by CPI since formation, that number would end up being right around four hundred dollars. So you know, little up, little down. Average is somewhere somewhere just just above two percent over that time period. But yeah, so it would end up being about four hundred, which is roughly the same. Again, not exactly an apples to apples comparison, but just to give you context of what that rate um, would be if it. Yeah, I've got a couple questions. Um, the parcel, uh, the the price that you're putting on each parcel, it, how's that payment going to be made? Is it going to be something that is going to be sent to the homeowners? Is it something? So, and I'll have to let me answer that question. Well, then. yeah, you can answer. I got a couple more. Okay. So the, the first question was, how, how does this assessment get paid? And this is a line item on your property tax bill. So it is something that's included on that tax bill, along with your general taxes, your ad valorem, plus whatever else is on there. You probably have Mosquito District or um, you know various other charges for community colleges and so forth. It is one of those line items on your tax bill. So if you pay your property taxes through your mortgage, it'll just be part of what your impounds pay. And once the parcel has been assessed, which I think is going to go through from what you're telling me, with um, every, the way things are weighted, uh, you know, my inclination is that it's going to go through as a yes. Once the price has been put on each parcel, will there be an increase over the years, or will there be a decrease, or how does it work? So the the rate. The maximum assessment rate, which is what will be established with, um, with the approval of the assessment district, so if this passes, that maximum rate would be allowed to increase by CPI up to 3%. Each year? Each year. The budget is set through an annual engineer's process. So there is a report that goes to council every single year. This actually happens with your existing district as well, typically in... I'm about to hit you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I talk with my hands. I better stand back. Um, April, May is when that process goes forward. And um, so that engineer's report would go to council each year with a budget of what is expected to be the, the cost estimate for the next fiscal year. So in May, June, you're looking, so this year we'd be looking at the 23-24 fiscal year and what the um, budget estimate is for that year. So if there are you know, whatever the case may be, grant money is available or some other sort of windfall, some other, you know, some other revenue that is coming in or um, the costs go down. Yeah, you know, landscaping costs miraculously decrease from where they are today. Um, you know, whatever the case may be, that is the annual opportunity 
to set the budget for the district and compare what's needed to the maximum assessment rate. When will we know what the parcel, uh, you know, the price will be? Is it going to be, you know, in, in June? Will it be in the end of the year? And do we? And if we don't like what we see as far as the price, do we have an option as far as disputing what we have to pay? In terms of the annual process, that there is a public hearing associated with the annual process. So for this year, for 23-24, the assessment amount is being set with this engineer's report, or the engineer's report that goes to council on whatever date I said, April 18th. Um, so that would be the engineer's report. That's what your ballot would be based on. So that would be the amount that you would know for this year. And so that result will be announced on June 7th. For next year, when that budget setting process comes around, there is a resolution of intention where a preliminary engineer's report is presented. That would be your opportunity either at that council meeting or the noticed public hearing that follows that's your opportunity to come and say, I don't, you know, this is too high or whatever. If there's a problem with your assessment relative to your parcel characteristics, meaning somehow you have a um, single family residential parcel, but somewhere along the line, the county data indicated that you have a commercial property. And, and, you know, or the score footage is off or, you know, something along those lines, there's an appeals process where you essentially would call and say, no, I don't have a 20,000 square foot house. I have a 2,000 square foot house. You know, that must just be a data error. So there is an appeals process to correct that sort of thing. Uh, the old information will not be on the ballot. Just the new, yeah, the new assessment amount that's proposed would be shown on your ballot as well. And then, were there more questions in the back there also? Um, Um, Danielle will help you offline with that, and we want to make sure we get to everyone else's questions if you want to ask your question. I go up on the side of my, because my house is small, I don't have that much property, so I, would, I don't want to go up on the side yeah, so uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for actually doing this, and I'm, I support this, but I, I have a separate issue that's probably very unpopular. Mine, mine is about the accountability piece. So I'm all for paying a little bit extra money, but um, my wife and I walk this area every day, and it takes weeks and sometimes months to get things fixed. There's still water dripping running all over the place that I've told somebody about. Gary, I don't know if he's here tonight. It's still running weeks and a month and a half later. You know, the water is going from 60,000 to 92,000 because we're wasting it. Or so, so I'm good with this. Uh, who's where's the accountability and how do we know we're going to get this when you take all that money from us? That's I, I think that's what I want to know. And I think most of our neighbors will probably support this if somebody 
can say, this is how you're going to get it. This is where the 92,000s go, and this is where the 45,000. I'm working on budgets at all my facilities now. They can't just throw a number at me. they got to tell me where they're getting it, and then my job is to then hold them accountable. Sorry, that's unpopular, but that's my biggest concern. I'm so, I support all of this. Thanks, Kevin, for the question. Um, this is part. This is the big part of the team right here that's going to help make sure that uh, we get uh, that the city gets and the residents get what what we're paying for. Um, part of I think I forget who alluded to it earlier. Part of uh, the next the other piece of that is the landscape oversight committee um, that uh, thanks to council support uh, has recently been established um, and they created the structure for that. Um, I believe the, the the makeup of that is. Uh, will mirror the council in, in a way to, you know, with one, uh, hoping to have one member um, representative for each district plus one at large, like the council is set up. Um, and then that, I believe, uh, it's set up, and Ryan can confirm probably, um, you know, meeting at least quarterly and then looking at each, is it potentially monthly? Um, with a report, regular report to council on the findings, recommendations, um, how the you know how the budgets are are looking. Um, so that that's the other piece is a regular report um, and information to council. Um, traffic count. Traffic count studies the gold standard to analyze our street traffic. We, we didn't, uh, in the uh, ER, the uh, engineer's report, and as you've described, we are using models, which are okay if, if that is the best thing that you have available to you. We have the actual numbers, and I've talked with the traffic department also, and it costs $400 per unit of a traffic study, so the costs are very workable, but it is not simple. But this whole process is not simple, so let's not be stopped by that. Actual count numbers of cars is a doable process, and actual is always superior to modeled, unless you cannot physically count. Uh, if we were trying to count the freeway, that would be quite difficult, of course. These would be placing counting devices in locations to identify how many cars are coming out of this area? How many cars are passing through? So to go with a model route, I just don't see that as being as believable as using a model. I, I didn't participate in one that I can recall. There, there have been several that they have done, but I'm saying physically counting. Sorry, I'm Ryan Punganee, but I'm the Associate Public Works Director and City Engineer. So I appreciate that comment as it relates to getting actual counts. As Sarah alluded to, we did take a look at that. We did try to see if there was a comparison between the 2018 um, ADT, but it was difficult for us because it was at the time that we were preparing the report, the, the numbers when we compared them to actual, we actually did look at the data that we were getting from, there's other things, not just tubes, you're referring to like tubes on the ground that you see when people are driving through. We, we looked at that and then we also looked at to see if like the street light data, there's actually programs out there that actually that counts that, GPS is it. So the numbers weren't reflecting what we thought we visually could see on manual campus being 50% of it being passed through traffic based on the actual counts. So we tried to our best to make an app, a theoretical count, which was the average daily tips that are being generated for the single family homes to the theoretical capacity that Manuel Campos could withstand. And that's that level of service. So we looked at that. We absolutely did take that into consideration as part of the process, but it would be a slice in time. It's looking at the data at one particular point and it's not trying to extract. That was, of course, 2018 numbers, which accounted for the development at the time. We're building up around Manuel Campos, right? So even if we did do live data right now, it wouldn't reflect the capacity that we could have in five years or 10 years. Um, it also reduced the general benefit, which is why we said that was a, a no-go. It actually, I think it was, 
a five, I don't even, it was a really low number and we were just like, this is not right for Manuel Campos, it's definitely a higher general benefit. So um, using the theoretical numbers, it actually benefits all the individual property owners um, on that front. Yeah, that's a good point. That's why we moved away from the, the traffic data that we started looking at because again, it just, you know, when you, you sort of start looking at numbers, you always have to think about what those numbers are saying to you. And um, when we did that evaluation, we we knew that they weren't quite representing the reality. So um, this was the, the next solution. Um, so we, we need to start to wrap it up here in the next few minutes, um, I think, so that we can get to the next meeting. We have maybe five minutes left. Is that right? So maybe time for one or two more questions. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question that wants to raise their hand? I see your hand, but you already asked one. <laughs> no? Okay. That's fine. Well, the Paradise Valley Estates is the big gorilla. Uh, are they going to be voting? Does anybody know? You're saying you've talked with the owner of that property and they intend to cast their ballot? I, I talked with the chief, uh, chief property officer uh, last year. Uh, and uh, his take was they didn't want to stand back from it and not influence. That was then. They're going from 60000 to 87000 total. That's going to be an average of $80 per unit additional fee going to their people. I don't know today what they will do. Then it's not a ballot returned. And so when we're tabulating ballots, just like in a general election, you don't need 50% of votes from all the people because you only get 30% voter turnout in the first place, right? So same thing here. We're looking at only the ballots returned and weighing the in favor and in opposition of those ballots returned. So if you get no ballots returned, there's no majority protest. All of the same factors that everyone else's assessment is based on. The lot size, the building size, the trip, um, average daily trips, et cetera, yes. In general, yeah, 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 that is generally how it works. Um, there's a couple of, yeah, yeah. That's why we're using the, the lot size and building size factors there. Um, and then the, yeah. All right, and I saw a hand up behind you, yeah. For the assessment on the lots, is the topography uh, considered when assessing, like I got a hill in the back, which is not as usable as somebody had a 10,000 flat grade? No, <laughs> my very short answer, no. We're not able to look at overall topography of each individual parcel, but we are looking at, at lot size and building size. But we're not looking at you know elevation or, um, or overall topography of property. There's one behind you. <laughs> I have a large home, so that means I'm gonna get triple price no. no? You can tell me and I can tell you the exact amount you're that you're paying and what you are. You have my number. Give me a call and I'll tell you the exact amount. Yeah. The assessment amount is available on Civic Mix. So you can look and see exactly what you're paying now and exactly what you would be paying under the proposed assessment. Because I just have to add some more to my tax. I paid it and it went up. So I found out why it went up. Yeah, that is something I wouldn't me. Meaning you, you added on to your house? Oh, no. oh, okay. You said added, so I wasn't, I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, just so everyone knows, uh, before Rick asks his question, uh, this flyer on the table, there is um, additional opportunities of more questions come up for you to reach out to city staff and ask questions. 
In addition to that, civicmic.com has a lot of information. And if you're not signed up with your email there, we will be um, posting, I think Ryan may have men mentioned it earlier, uh, digestible pieces of information about the engineer's report. But if you don't have access to the internet or don't go on the internet and you want to know what is my proposed assessment gonna be, you can call Danielle or Michelle at this number. So write this number down and you can call and ask for one of us and we will tell you what your assess proposed assessment will be. So 1-800. Hold on, they're getting the lids off the pins. All right, all right. 1-800-676-7516. Ask for Danielle or Michelle. If you blend it together, they'll get you to the right place. Um, they, you know, you live in the city of Fairfield, you have a question for one of us, they'll send you over to us and we will tell you what your proposed assessment is if you don't have access to online. If you want to see it yourself online, go to civicmic.com forward slash Fairfield. Lots of information. There's an interactive map. Uh, Civic Danielle. All right. I just wanted to add to what Danielle just described and then the list of, of ways to connect and ask questions. Uh, we're open to hearing what you all, this is your community, this is where you live, you know your, re your neighbors and your residents, so if you guys have um, suggestions on how we can better share the information, and get the word out, we're open to that as well. We want people to get the information so they can make the decisions that they want to make so that they can get informed. And so each community, each you know, uh, LLMD district is a little bit different in the makeup of the district and how they like to get information. So we're open to that as well. So if you have that, um, you don't have to say it on the spot, but if you want to send that, those suggestions you know, via, the, via email or give us a call, please do. My last questions. A uh, couple of challenges. One is the meeting is getting ready to be called. I, I have been at every one of these meetings that's taken place and frequently I've been one of three residents that showed up. So this is phenomenal and fantastic and thank you, thank you for being here and participating in your community. Please encourage your neighbors to be involved. Going to civicmike.com gives you the basics. You can learn a lot, talk to people. You're gonna get more information at that point. So I'm kind of in one hand challenging that we're canceling or stopping the meeting at this point. I know you have another one to go to, but you, you want to be able to answer the questions that take place. Uh, the last one for uh, NBS, as far as the engineer's report, after 20 years of doing this, I really would have thought that there would have been more plain English to this process, uh, such as having a, uh, a summary that would be easily consumed by residents, such as what are the main points of it. And I know you guys are working on some stuff now that's going to go out. But when an engineer's report that goes out that's got 25 pages of text, 25 pages of assessments, People see that and their eyes roll back in their head, kind of like what you're doing now for my long-winded question. So in situations where you have the ability to give great details, you have. The ADT, for those who haven't looked into this, how they're calculating all the things are, are to the Nats eyebrow in the report. But when it comes down to what does it cost to do the landscaping, the least amount of information in the entire report is about the most important thing for me, how much is it going to cost to get done? So if it could have included a greater breakdown other than there's 90, 910,000 square feet and there's 1,825 trees, that's as detailed as it gets on how much does this cost to do. It's not even broken down into a, how much does it cost per square foot? Well, we're taking into account the water, the electricity. You know, something to make it as supported as the rest of the information. It really, really lacks in the engineer's report on the most important part for the people here as to what is my landscaping going to look like? What is it going to be done? And the last part is, as we get go forward to the end, uh, when people do a vote, and they're going to vote for either yes or no, I'm for yes, but I want people to be informed. That's the most important part. As a working group member, that's my goal that I've committed to, is helping people become informed. When someone wants to say, no, I want the old district, they need to fully understand the old district doesn't exist anymore. The monies that are available are only going to pay probably about 20%. This is my numbers, that's why Chris will be much, much better at this. We have the $80,000 cost of this process. We have the $175,000 loan. We have a new company, TerraCare, and they're great. 
They are wonderful. I love them. They're expensive compared to the cheap people we used before. That means your money, the old money, the $275,000, deduct the loan payment, deduct the cost of the engagement payment, and then you've got an expensive company. What you were getting before, you're probably going to end up with 20% of the work that you used to see being done with your money now. So please, as you go forward, and I know the city has got to be straight up in the middle. You can't lean one way or the other, and I fully understand that. But when you're giving people the information, the other side, if you vote no, we're only telling them you will have reduced services. Please, if you can put a number on it, I'm guessing 20% from what, I, from what I've calculated, but there's a real number, and let people know so they're making that informed decision. That's what we need to be making is informed decisions. And it's a oh, scope of work for it to say that, yes. Yeah. There's, Let people really understand. Yeah. One, what you guys are really doing when it comes to the landscape, there are many yeah. people who just think landscaping is cutting grass. Right? Compared to what was being done. Okay. You're doing a great job. It's all yeah. wonderful. I'm all in favor of it. But when I look at it, I want to say, where's my dollars going? What is it I was paying for? <coughs> what is it I'm going to pay for? Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. I am sorry to interrupt. I do want to say that there are a lot of opportunities. Please take this flyer. Um, there's also discussion points on civicmic.com if you want to keep having these conversations. Um, we do uh, have to, to wrap the meeting up, and I just wanted to stop and thank you all for being here today. Truly appreciate it. Um, again, I see a lot of familiar faces, and I appreciate everybody here. Thank you.